This photo was taken on December the 2nd of last year, the day of the first big snowstorm of this current winter. I took it from the uh, window of our family practice health center just across the street from our beautiful hospital. And I don't know if you can see because it was taken with my cell phone, the snow that was kind of driving at a 45 degree angle down onto the street. I took it for a reason because I was thinking about a particular patient, a woman we'll call Jessie, who I knew had an appointment to come and see us at the hospital that day. Jessie is a young mom and she lives in Port Hope and she uh, struggles with postpartum depression. Any of you who know someone or have yourselves been affected by postpartum depression or anxiety will know that this can be a very serious illness, that it affects not just the individual woman, but the whole of the family ecosystem, and that it can have significant mental and physical intergenerational effects. So it is critically important that we recognize it, that we deal with the stigma surrounding it, and that we get women the treatment they need as quickly as possible. So you can imagine what I was thinking as I was looking out the window, thinking about this young woman having to strap her young baby into the back seat of the car in Port Hope and drive on highways and snowy roads to try to get to her appointment in our Department of Psychiatry and our mental health program that day. And you know, and I know, that she wouldn't have come. And that would have had significant effects, not only for her, but for the whole of her family. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Because when we think about the impact of technology in the world around us, in every sector, how it's completely transformed almost every interaction that we have as consumers and as uh, family members and friends, uh, the healthcare system hasn't been as slow to the party as you might think. In fact, digitization is happening all around us in healthcare. Almost every hospital, almost every doctor's office, almost every pharmacy, almost every home care provider is using it in some way. Not to say that those systems are necessarily talking to each other yet, but we're getting there. And of course, any symptom you might have, Dr. Google's got an answer for you. Whether it's accurate or not is also up for conversation. And for anything that you are concerned about with respect to your health, of course, there's an app for that. So it's not that we haven't been seeing huge inroads of technology and digitization and the use of big data in the world of healthcare services. The question is, are we applying technology and our digital uh, interventions and power in ways that help the people who need it the most? Or do we risk a significant mismatch between what the market will bring us in the area of health and health technology and what it is that someone like Jesse needs? Well, this matters, of course, because the trends in healthcare show us very clearly that there are particular groups and populations of people who need the, the system to respond to them today uh, and yesterday, in fact. Some of those trends you're very familiar with. The first is demography. So we know that the population around us is aging. And of course, because women live longer than men, that aging process, as we'll hear from Dr. Roshan later, particularly affects women and the communities that they live in. We know that chronic disease rates are rising, in part because we've gotten so good at taking diseases that used to kill people and helping them to live longer with them. So whether it's a cancer diagnosis or heart disease or diabetes or HIV or chronic lung disease, more and more Canadians are living longer with more chronic diseases. And yet we have built healthcare systems in which every road leads to the emergency department and every road leads to an inpatient hospital admission. And that is how we've ended up with the crisis that we see in so many of our inpatient hospitals across Ontario and beyond today with this phenomenon of, of so-called hallway healthcare. It's because we haven't done an adequate job of thinking about how are we going to serve that aging population, that group of people with complex chronic diseases who will inevitably experience peaks and valleys in their needs of care, and therefore everybody ends up in the eMERGE. And until we have figured out how to use digital and virtual care interventions in ways that will help these populations, this trend is going to continue. Luckily, at Women's College Hospital, we always begin from the same starting point, which is that we know that healthcare service delivery is not just about getting people appointments with healthcare providers. 
is every service that we deliver in our healthcare system is an opportunity to express who we are as a community. And as Mayor Tory was saying in his remarks earlier, healthcare systems and the way that we design them are truly an expression of our values. Do we believe in taking care of one another in our moments of vulnerability? Do we believe that access to care should be based on need? And if so, then how can we bring to bear our greatest research minds and our greatest creativity and our greatest innovation impulses to bear on these critically important questions? We take this very deeply to heart. Which is how we've ended up declaring at Women's Co College Hospital what I believe to be the most exciting pillar of any strategic plan of any hospital in the country, which is the launch of Women's Virtual, Canada's first virtual hospital, the first opportunity to build technology into a healthcare environment in service of a healthier and more equitable world. So the, I'm going to describe what this means to you because um, I'm practicing for when people ask me at cocktail parties, what do you mean when you say a virtual hospital? We have three goals at the virtual hospital. The first is enhancing access to specialty care. And specifically what we're talking about here is reducing wait times for outpatient specialist visits, which we know have traditionally been a real Achilles heel of Canadian healthcare systems. The second goal is reducing avoidable emergency department visits and avoidable hospital admissions. We will always need traditional hospitals. We should all be grateful that they are there for us when we need them the most. But too often we are using emergency department and hospital visits because they are the only tool that we have to support people who are sick. And so we want to address that. And the third goal, and this is an important one, is to help people stay in their homes longer. It's aging in place. And so that doesn't mean that people won't be interacting with healthcare systems, but as much as possible, we want to do it in, in ways that support people staying in the community and closest to home. So what happens when you get a bunch of academics together and say, well, we're going to build a virtual hospital? Well, what happens is what we've been going through over the last 18 months on, on our team at Women's Virtual, which is to step back and look first to the literature, we looked all over the world to understand what we could learn, not only from the health sector, but for, from other sectors about how to incorporate technology in meaningful ways, in, in, in disruptive ways to change our processes. We looked to uh, uh, advances in other countries, whether it's the Mayo Clinic, whether it's Mercy Virtual in St. Louis, Missouri, whether it's Denmark, which has the, the most uh, digitized public sector in the world, the Netherlands, and the list goes on, to be able to learn uh, from the best of what other countries are doing. And then we looked internally to our own expertise, because in fact, at our Institute for Health Systems Solutions and Virtual Care, led by Dr. Sasha Batia, we actually have the nation's leading group of researchers when it comes to digital health evaluation when in healthcare system design. And we brought all of that expertise and knowledge to bear when we design the model of care that I'm going to explain to you now. In the bottom most and smallest bubble, we talk about in-person care because we will always be engaged in a human enterprise and there will always be moments when a face-to-face -face encounter is what's needed by an individual. But let's think about somebody like Jesse. We have set ourselves the very important parameter as follows, that if I ask you to drive to Women's College Hospital to park in our basement for 24 bucks, to sit in our waiting room and wait for seven or 12 or even 45 minutes of face time with a healthcare provider, it should be because that is the best way to deal with your issue. And if it is not the best way to deal with your issue, then we should have an array of other options to offer you in consultation with your healthcare provider, with you, and looking to the evidence about what works for someone in your situation. So it might be face-to-face -face care, but it might be a video visit which is in fact what we did for Jesse that day. That day we became Ontario's second hospital to, to offer uh, integrated video visits through our electronic health record. So Jesse was able to keep her appointment that day sitting in her home in Port Hope, consulting with our psychiatrist downtown uh, here in Toronto. It could have been that she would have had an, uh, an interaction with us through asynchronous messaging, effectively secure email uh, interactions with her providers because she's got a quick question about her medication or wants a point of clarification. It could have been actually what we call connected expertise where Jessie might see her family physician 
at home in Port Hope, and our specialist would offer immediate consultation support to that family doctor. I'm not talking about a week from now or three months from now or six months from now, but within 48 hours, a warm handover, a reply from a specialist to a family physician to say, yes, it's okay, that medication is safe in breastfeeding, or I would re recommend that you begin with this approach or that approach. It could have been through enhanced access, which in fact we offered uh, to people like Jessie in her situation, whether that's online peer support groups, whether it's moderated webinars, whether it's online education modules, whether it's curated apps that we believe based on the evidence will help Jessie to manage her own disease because most of the time, Jessie isn't interacting with us. Most of the time, she's responsible for her own care. And so we want to put that uh, as many resources as we can into her hands to help her manage herself. So, you know, it would be a reasonable question to say, well, all kinds of hospitals are offering all kinds of technological things. What's so different about this? What's different about this is that we are talking about completely redesigning the model of care of an entire organization. We've started in mental health and surgery. We'll be rolling out across the rest of the organization in the coming years. But the point is that we're not just taking processes that used to be offered on paper or face-to-face -face and transitioning them to the digital versions of themselves. We're completely rethinking the way that technology can be incorporated into every aspect of the care model. That's what makes it unique. That is what we mean when we say technology in service of a healthier and more equitable world. We mean that we're helping people like Jesse access the care that they need when and where and how they need it most. Or as one of my surgical colleagues recently put it, we are not using technology to replace human contact. We're using it to enhance human contact. This is the future of healthcare. Thank you.